in the garden. Thank you, Aaron. What a great assurance to know that he walks with us and talks with us and calls us his own. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together as we sing Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon, all you shining stars, the waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. Let's sing it together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son.
the one who is above and beyond us. Praise God, the Spirit, promised one, the presence of our Lord with us. Pour out your power in this place. We worship you. We stand amazed. Bless the Lord of my soul. And forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, and who satisfies you with good. Let's praise his name together. Praise God for all that he has done, who was and is and is to come. him today. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess to the name of Jesus Christ. And we rejoice that we can read again in Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and infants. You have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. O Lord, how majestic is your name. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body Oh, Lord. 
church please be seated as our praise team goes up to the choir loft let me introduce you to these three uh, young ladies and men this is some products from our uh, kids choir a few years ago and now they're all part of our student choir we're very grateful to them this welcome michael walker and bethany and walden kennedy as they lead us in yes he can Yeah. 
Good morning. How's everyone today? Wasn't that great? Thank you for sharing those young people with us. That was awesome. If you're a guest here today, normally teaching from this pulpit is our interim pastor, Dr. Jim Shaddix. He's out today doing other things with his life. And we are privileged to have Dr. Kevin Baggett, our discipleship pastor. He'll be teaching us today out of uh, Second Peter. A uh, very challenging and encouraging message. And so, Kevin, we pray for you today. Glad you're in this place today. He's normally up in the BX service where we have another young man preaching up there for him today. But it's good to have you here if you're a guest today. Um, we have a lot of things happening in this place called Brainerd Baptist Church. And I want to bring your attention to some of those up on the screen. If you'll look with me, this week, this Wednesday evening, begins our midweek service kickoff which means we all have all of our activities for our children, all of our activities for our students, and some other classes going on. Be sure to go online and look at all those activities starting at 6 p.m. until 7.30. So that's a big event happening this week. Also, week zero coming up on Saturday up in the BX from 10 until 1. It is our men's event for the day. And we have some good things happening. I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago we got a crazy thing called cornhole going on that day. And I think some barbecue and just some things for guys. We'll talk more about men's opportunities and events coming up on that day. So we'd love to get for all the men to gather up. Be sure to sign up for that. And we're looking forward to seeing you on Saturday. And also, where's Brian at? Christmas in August? Okay, I see it up there. Uh, one of the greatest things about this fellowship is the holiday time. And uh, our choir and orchestra do an awesome job of ushering in the birth and the celebration of the birth of Christ. Uh, they'll begin their training. And they're going to have a training Sunday. We'll have lunch. If you're interested in being part of this, these things that were going on this morning on this stage, they'd love for you to come and join them in their holiday preparation and it begins early around here, and so they'll share more details with that right after this service on Sunday down in the fellowship hall. So we're looking forward to that. If you love Brainerd Baptist Church, we say amen. amen. So I, I think that sometimes at Brainerd we forget just how the Lord has blessed us, that we have so many sent ones that like these that we just saw, like ones that we saw a few weeks ago, ones that we're going to see in just another few weeks. They're, they're in my office, one of the things that I do is I have prayer cards that I flip through every uh, day of all of our people that are out uh, doing the Lord's work. And we, I, we have more than two weeks of flipping a car, a new card every day as I pray for those folks. And if you uh, are looking for ways to pray, maybe that's a way that you want to do it. I think there's prayer cards in the back, and that's a great way to... Uh, to get, uh, yeah, to get connected and remember these folks. And uh, when they show up in 4D, you already know them because you've seen them in 2D. So for those that don't uh, know me, my name is Kevin Baggett. If you're a guest, I'm thankful uh, that you're here. Uh, if you do know me, uh, you know that I'm the discipleship pastor here, here at Brainerd Baptist. And, uh, and so every time I come, uh, you kind of uh, learn or learn, find out something different about your discipleship pastor. One of the things that you may or may not know about me is I, I grew up in a small, on a small farm in North Georgia. And so my dad has uh, cattle and a nice little garden. Both of my granddads uh, had cattle and farmers and they, I mean, they know how to do all that stuff. Um, when you hear me say that, you may think that I have some clue as to what happens on a farm. That would be wrong. Uh, so when I was growing up, I cared a lot more about fastballs and free throws than I did fertilizer and, and hay fills. Uh, I, I just didn't really care about it. And I was really looking not to do those sort of things very much. Um, but I was really good at doing what I was told to do on the farm without asking the why or really caring what the why was. That was who I was when I was growing up. But one of the things that I did learn about as from my dad and my granddads was the, the importance of a seed. Do you guys know the importance of a seed? Even for someone who doesn't care about gardening, if you don't care about plants, you have to admit that seeds are amazing. It's fascinating. Within a small shell exist 
all that's necessary, all the necessary ingredients to make a full fruitful plant. And when you think about it, an acorn is a great example. It's two to three inches in diameter, has all the ingredients within that two to three inch diameter little acorn to make an oak tree that grows to be 40 to 80 feet tall. It's, It's fascinating. Seeds are amazing. Peter, the fisherman, he was a lot like me. He probably grew, he probably didn't really care that much about plants, but he spent a whole lot of time walking and learning as one of Jesus' disciples. He learned about, or he should have learned about, a lot about farming. Jesus told story after story, parable after parable about a sheep and about seeds. Peter must have, had to have, picked something up along the way. And as Peter begins this final letter that we began studying through last week, he gives a final plea to the church, a plea that they would live uncompromised lives, lives that are committed to righteousness and truth, even when they face temptation and false teachers, that they would be committed to righteousness, be committed to the truth. And as Peter writes this letter, I wonder if he wasn't thinking of one of Jesus' parables as he begins this, this letter. You see, Peter was in the audience the day that Jesus stood before a crowd and he started talking and telling the parable of a sower, the sower representing God, and how the sower was sowing the seed, the gospel. It seemed like the sower was careless with that precious seed. You see, some of the seed, it fell on the path and birds swooped in and they ate it all up. Some of that seed, it fell on rocky ground where there There wasn't much soil. It popped up quick, but then it didn't last because there wasn't root there. Some of that seed, that precious seed, it fell in the thorns, and the thorns gathered around it, and they choked out the seed that was coming up. But some of that seed, some of that seed fell on good ground, and it began to grow into a plant that would produce fruit exponentially. It's a story, a parable that seems to have impacted Peter, our author, this pastor that we've learned about so much over the last several weeks. What we find today as Peter continues in the beginning of this second final letter is the theology behind the parable of the, of the sower. Last week, we looked at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This week, we're going to be in verses 5 through 11. But before we get to 5 and 11, we have to go back and look at one particular verse that's very important for what we're going to look at today, a particular verse, verse number 3. Peter shares with us a great truth. He says, his divine power, God's divine power, has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory goodness. What Peter paints here in verse number three is a picture of the seed, a seed that if we are followers of Jesus, the seed of the gospel, the relationship that we have with the Lord contains within it everything required in our life for godliness. Everything that we need to follow after Jesus, to do exactly what he calls us to do is available to us in that seed. It comes to us. It's available through the gospel. And it's available through our personal, intimate relationship with our Father, God. Through this relationship, Peter says the committed follower of Jesus can find escape from the corruption of the world and escape from the evil desires that come from that world. Within that seed that the sower planted into our hearts is all that we need to live righteously, all that we need to faith to live faithfully according to to God's will. It's all available and accessible to us. In 2 Peter, verses 5 and 11, we're going to see the main point of our sermon. The main point of the text is this. We confirm God's redemptive work in our lives as we pursue godliness until we enter his eternal kingdom. If you're taking notes, that's the most important sentence that you'll hear today. I'm going to say it again. We confirm God's redemptive work in our lives as we pursue godliness until we enter his eternal 
kingdom. So if you're with me today, let's open up our Bible, 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 11, but we're going to focus our attention on verses 5 through 11. Peter writes, his, God's, divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that's in the world because of evil desire. For this very reason, because of verses three and four, because of God's work of this seed, because of that, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted, has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election because if you do these things, you will never stumble. You'll never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. You see, the seed of the gospel planted into our hearts should lead us to godliness, should lead us to godliness because of our love and our commitment to our Savior and our Lord. It should be a natural outpouring to pursue godliness because of what he's done within us, because of the change and the redemption that we have experienced. Here's what we're going to see today in our passage, three statements, three truths. Our pursuit of godliness is rooted in God's redemptive work. Our pursuit of godliness rooted in God's redemptive work. The second statement, our pursuit of godliness is the fruit of God's redemptive work. And then finally, our pursuit of godliness is the confirmation of God's redemptive work. Let's look at that first statement together. Our pursuit of godliness is rooted in God's redemptive work. Because of the seed of the gospel that we discussed in verse number three, we've already looked at that. Peter says that we should make every effort to supplement our faith, to grow in our faith. And so that leads us to a question, what is our faith? Well, our faith is the effectual calling of our Lord that draws us to believe in him and to put our faith in Jesus. You see, our faith is God actively calling and working within us while we actively respond to his calling. Faith is a belief that leads us to, have to give a commitment, to make a commitment to an intimate relational knowledge of God that Peter talked about in verses 3 and 4. You'll remember last week, Dr. Shaddix talked about that word knowledge and how it's more than just practical knowledge. It's an intimate, relational knowledge. So when you know someone, when you know all about them, an intimate, close, deep, relational knowledge of someone else. That's what God's calling us to. Peter writes, because of that, for this reason, because of the divine power that resides in the gospel, that seed that the Lord puts in our heart, because of that gospel, because of the relationship that you have with the Lord, with God, make every effort to supplement your faith. Because of the seed of the gospel, because of that, because that seed has taken root in your heart, you should make every effort to supplement your faith, to nurture your faith, to feed your faith. The gospel takes root when we put our faith in Jesus, when we confess our sins, repent of our sins, and commit to follow after Jesus, to follow in his ways. We begin, we allow that seed to begin to take root. We begin a relationship with the Lord. That seed finds good soil, and we are to make every effort, Peter writes, to, free, to feed and to supplement the faith that sprouts within our heart when that seed finds good soil. I think the best way to describe that is that we should pursue godliness because of our affection for our Savior. 
We pursue God's will in our lives because his will has now become our will. We are transformed into desiring what he desires. We desire what he wants. We've laid down our desires. We've taken up his desires. But that's But there's also a way that when we look at this passage that we can interpret it incorrectly. There's a way that when we read this passage on its own that we can understand it to mean that we're to pursue God by making every effort. And then that long sentence that we just looked at where Peter talks about and gives us an explanation what that pursuit should look like. There's a way that we would understand that that this passage, this sentence, to mean that we're supposed to pursue godliness for our salvation. We're supposed to pursue godliness for our salvation, but that is an incorrect interpretation. What what Peter's writing here is that, in fact, we're to pursue godliness from our salvation. We don't pursue godliness for our salvation. We pursue godliness from our salvation. That is a very important distinction that we should all understand. Let me explain it really quickly. I love my wife, Laura. She's sitting on the front row down here. I do things for my wife. Husbands, that's good. Marital counsel free. Uh, Take that. I do things for my wife because I love her. I naturally do them. I desire to do things and to please her because I love her. What I do for my wife comes out of a love for her. Now, if Brian were to ask me to do the same things, that might feel like a chore, Brian. I love you, but it still might feel like a chore. I love and I do things for Laura because of my love for her. It comes out of that love. Our pursuit of godliness, that pursuit of godliness is rooted in God's redemptive work within us. Because of our faith and our love for the Lord, we make every effort to supplement our faith, to grow it and to nurture it. We pursue godliness from our salvation. Look back at verse number three. The salvation that we pursue, it, we pursue it because of his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Peter is going to share a list of virtues Virtues that should come from our faith. But the pursuit of these virtues, doing these chores, working and nurturing and growing our faith in this way, it's rooted in our sal- in the redemptive saving work of God in our lives. We don't work for our salvation. We work from our salvation. Today, as we look at these virtues, if you don't If you don't have these virtues or if you're not growing in these virtues, the response isn't to work harder. The response isn't do more. The response should be to assess the root of faith in your life. Assess the soil in which that gospel seed, that relationship with the Lord has landed. Just like the seed that fell on rocky soil, it's possible that the soil in some of our lives might be shallow that the sun scorched it, it died because it didn't have deep roots. Our response today as we assess our soil soil, is that we should, as we work through these virtues, if we determine that we're lacking in some way, then we should assess the roots of the gospel in the soil of our lives. Have we truly put our faith in Jesus is a question that we should ask. If we have truly put our faith in Jesus, are we supplementing our faith and allowing that seed of the gospel, that relationship with the Lord to grow and flourish in our life through deepening our relationship with the Lord, through doing things like prayer and Bible study and being involved in what's happening in our local church body? Are we supplementing and nourishing that seed? Peter writes that we're to supplement our faith, supplement the soil in which the seed of the gospel is found. Supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness. All of these virtues have to do with our relationship with the Lord, our God, our Savior. 
I'm going to look at these quickly, but as we begin to look at all of these, it's important to understand that these virtues, they're not listed necessarily in sequential order. You don't have to finish one before you can move on to the other. Peter's following a literary style in his day of listing a number of characteristics of faith that we should pursue, but should be increasingly growing simultaneously in our lives. So, It may be helpful to think of Peter standing beside a small oak tree and talking about the characteristics that you see in that oak tree. He may talk about things like, look at the trunk, look at the limbs, look at the leaves, look at the blossoms, look at the sprouts, all characteristics of a tree that's growing, just like your faith should be growing. All of these aspects of your faith should be growing. We supplement these things. His desire is not for each of the parts of the tree to grow to maturity before the other parts grow. That would be silly, wouldn't it? Can you imagine a tree that had a fully grown mature trunk with no limbs or leaves or roots that are completely full and grown and only a small sprout sticking up out of the ground? That's not what Peter is talking about. He's giving us a full picture of what our, how our faith should grow and how it should eventually culminate in the final virtue that Peter is going to list. He says that we're supposed to supplement our faith first with goodness. Goodness can, can be also be translated here and may be better translated as moral excellence, as righteousness, as holiness. Romans 3 will tell us that goodness It doesn't originate in us. None of us are good. We've all sinned and fallen short of the good of the glory of God. Goodness that Peter talks about here, the goodness that comes from us originates in our salvation, in the work of the Lord that's happening in our hearts. It originates in that seed of the gospel that germinates in the good soil of faith. The Holy Spirit begins to change the desires in our heart from pursuing our evil desires instead of pursuing God's good and righteous desires. We pursue goodness. That's a characteristic of those that have faith. We desire goodness because of God's redemptive work in our lives. We also supplement our faith with knowledge. Now this word knowledge is very different than the one that Peter used in verse number three. The one in three, remember, the deep relational knowledge. This Verse, this, this reference to knowledge is actually a lesser knowledge. It's practical wisdom. It says that as we grow in our faith, that we will grow in practical ri- wisdom. Proverbs should immediately come to all of our minds as we study God's word. As we grow in understanding, we become more Christ-like. We become and grow in our practical wisdom. God's redemptive work in our life and our pursuit of godliness will also see us grow in the area of self-control. I said a couple weeks ago as we were preaching through 1 Peter that I believe one of the greatest markers for spiritual maturity for any believer is spiritual control. It's a marker that I hope personally to grow in more and more every day. I want to be, have and be known for the self for self-control. We live in a world with no self-control. We live in a world actually that is opposite of self-control. The world tells us that we're supposed to live to the fullest, live it up, get the most and the greatest that you can because this is all there is. But the gospel tells us a different story. And our faith in that gospel causes us to have self-control. Self-control is restraining, is the restraining of personal desire, our want to. Seeing something we want, whether that be a thing or even a person, and not coveting it or pursuing it. Having an impulse to say something, to respond or react in an ungodly way, and instead of allowing that thing to come out of our mouth, we control our tongue. That's self-control. We all have opinions. Self-control is knowing when to share those opinions and when not to. In today's world, we have the ability to share our opinion on anything and everything, not just with our mouth, but with our thumbs. You see, today in the world that we live in, we can, in a moment's thought, share our opinion. We can not have self-control, and it will be out there for all of the world to see. Today, we have to grow in self-control. 
the person pursuing godliness, the person accessing God's power in their lives will be a person that's growing in self-control. After self-control, Peter lists endurance as another characteristic that we should be growing in our faith. From the, he lists endurance. From the seed of faith, the believer has access to endure hardships and suffering. Peter writes to the church that he writes this to the church that's under the rule of evil Nero. Probably the church is going through more persecution, greater persecution than it's ever gone through. And Peter says, supplement your faith with endurance. Persevere, endure, hang in there, keep going. You can do it through God's divine power, which you have access through your faith in him. As you pursue God in this way, you'll begin to look like God. Your ways will become more and more like his ways. By supplementing your faith in these ways, by growing in all of these ways, will grow in godliness. Your life will begin to reflect God's characteristics instead of your own natural characteristics. Oh, how it would be wonderful for people to look at all of the followers of Jesus at Brainerd Baptist Church and say, I don't know much, but they just reflect Jesus. All of these virtues and characteristics which we should be pursuing, the ones that we've looked at so far, deal with our relationship with God, our vertical relationship. Our growing relationship with God is rooted in that redemptive work, that seed of the gospel that goes into our hearts. But Peter has a few more characteristics to share. He's not finished. Our growing relationship with God, our pursuit of godliness will also affect our horizontal relationships. Not just the vertical relationship that we have with the Lord, but also our horizontal relationships, the relationships that we have with others. Peter says, because of God's redemptive work, we will pursue brotherly affection. Brotherly affection. How many times have believers needed to be reminded in the last three years to be kind to one another, to be affectionate to one another? There have been moments in our church even where we've not been kind about meeting or not meeting. There have been times when we've maybe not been as kind as we should about whether we wear a mask or don't wear a mask. We've shared and walked through times of social and political differences. There's been transitions. It seems like numerous transitions in our church family during these times. When our faith is lacking in pursuing self-control and knowledge and endurance, all those things work against our ability and our, and our pursuit of brotherly affection. Here's the question for us today. Are we growing in brotherly affection? Does that characterize us? Are we more and more kind? Peter says, be kind to one another. He says, be thoughtful to one another. Be generous with one another. Be graceful with one another. Have grace on one another. This pursuit of brotherly affection, and it's rooted, this is the pursuit of brotherly affection, and it's rooted in God's redemptive work within our heart. You see, that seed that goes into our heart of the gospel, giving us, in verse number three, everything required for life and godliness, that seed there's enough of the Lord in that seed to allow us to be kind to one another, to have affection for one another. We should desire to be more and more like this as followers of Jesus every day. And ultimately, our pursuit of godliness will culminate in love. We'll love one another. The same love that God had for us when he cast that seed into our hearts, that seed that redeemed us, that seed that, that seed that we didn't deserve but that we received in spite of who we are, that type of love is the type of love that we should be sharing with one another. The word here for love is agape. Now, there are lots of pastors and theologians who give way too much credence to all the different Greek words for love. But in this case, it's worth noting what type of love Peter's talking about. He's talking about agape love, a love that is sacrificial, love that originates with God, the love perfect, perfectly demonstrated in Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. When our faith grows, when our faith arises and gains, culminates in love, 
what happens is, is that we begin to love others as Jesus loves them. There's a lot that could be said here, but to say it succinctly, the follower of Jesus should be growing in loving others with the love of Christ, sharing and demonstrating the gospel to others. Our pursuit of all these virtues and characteristics is rooted in God's redemptive work in our lives. Our ability to grow in these virtues is dependent upon that gospel seed and God's divine power that lies within our hearts, the seed of the gospel. And the germination of salvation should lead us to pursue these virtues of godliness. As you look back at these virtues, as you consider your own life, what does your life say about the soil of your heart? When we come to know the Lord, we don't immediately mature into oak trees. It's a process of growth. It's a process of sanctification. It's also a process that won't be completed until we enter into God's kingdom. Our faith should grow into a tree that's characterized of these things, goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. We pursue these virtues because because of God's redemptive work in our hearts. That's what motivates us to pursue godliness. That's what motivates us and changes the desires of our heart. We don't work for our salvation. We work from our salvation. That leads us to the next section of our passage. Not only is our pursuit of godliness rooted in God's redemptive work, our pursuit of godliness is the fruit of God's redemptive work. Peter gives us a comparison in verse number 8 and verse number 9. If you possess these qualities, it means this. If you don't possess these qualities, it means that. Here's what it means if you possess these qualities. Peter writes, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the strongest insults that any one person can throw or or cast at another person is to say you're useless. No one wants to be useless and no one wants a plant that's unfruitful. We want to be useful and we want to be fruitful. In order to be useful to the Lord and fruitful for his mission, we have to be pursuing godliness in increasing measure. That amplifies how we close our last point. God doesn't expect us to be a finished product at the time that we put our faith in him. When, you, when we make that prayer, when we give our life to Jesus, that, he doesn't expect a finished product at that moment. But we should possess these traits in increasing measure. These traits should be growing in our lives, each one of those increasing daily. Our desires for the things of the Lord should be growing. Our taste for the things of the Lord should be increasing. A commitment to follow the Lord doesn't mean that someone will immediately and always find victory over every sin. It doesn't mean that we will immediately lose the taste for the things of the world. But a commitment to follow the Lord does mean that our, that our affections and the, and the desire of the person is to always be moving in the direction of godliness. Not because we have to move in that direction but because it's our desire, the heart cry of our heart, of our soul, that we continue to be more and more godly. There are times when we'll fall. There are times when we'll fail. But that's the traje- trajectory that we, our lives are on. This desire is the fruit of the redemptive work of God in our hearts, of that seed that lands in the soil of our hearts. In verse number 9, Peter contrasts the person who has this fruit with the person who does not. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted. They've forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. The person who doesn't desire or pursue godliness is blind because of their short-sightedness. I can relate to short-sighted blindness. There may be a few of you in here who can commiserate with me. I can still read a book today if you take my glasses. If I hold it close, I can still read words on a page. But if someone were to come and take my glasses from me, I would be useless to do basically anything else. I wouldn't be able to distinguish any one of you who are out there. I wouldn't be able to drive. I would barely be able to walk safely if someone came and took my glasses. I can't see anything far off. I'm blind because of my nearsightedness. To be spiritually nearsighted is to lose sight of eternity. 
is to treat this world and the evil desires we have in this world as if they are ultimate and final. It's to think that there's nothing better than what this world has to offer. There's nothing more satisfying than what this world can give us. As Peter says, this short-sighted blindness gives evidence that we've forgotten the good news and the redemptive work of God in our life. What's more, we've forgotten that the world, that there, the world to come, that eternity waits for us just on the other side of this life. As we continue to study through this book, this letter, Peter's going to say over and over, remember, remember the gospel, remember the redeeming work of God, remember the truth, remember eternity, remember, 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 remember. He says that because we're so prone to be short-sighted. We're so prone to allow our short-sightedness to blind us. And so Peter's going to talk to these people in his last plea for them that they would, that they would remember Remember all of the things that the Lord has done. Remember eternity. Don't forget this world's not the end. Don't forget what Jesus did for you. Don't live a spiritually nearsighted life. Our pursuit for godliness is the fruit of God's redemptive work in our lives. And finally, our pursuit of godliness is confirmation of God's redemptive work in our lives. You see, an orange tree bears oranges. An apple tree bears apples, a pear tree bears pears, a peach tree peaches, banana tree bananas, the list goes on and on. Even if you're like me and you can't tell the difference between any tree on the planet, you can tell a tree by the fruit that's hanging from its branches. Peter writes to people that he loves. He did this in 1 Peter. He says it again. Whenever he says brothers and sisters, he says it because he wants you to hear him. He loves these people. He says, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Confirm, prove who you are. The fruit that hangs on from the branches of our lives gives testimony of the seed that's planted in our hearts. We don't make every effort to earn our salvation. We make every effort to confirm and validate who God has made us. The redemptive work of God in our lives, the fruit of the effective work of God in our lives is the pursuit of godliness. It's a desire to be more and more like him. It's, evident, it, it's evidences are the virtues that Peter's already mentioned in our text today and those virtues increasing in our lives. The false teachers that we will soon hear about in 2 Peter, they bragged. They bragged about this calling and election that Peter mentions here. People, they said that because of their calling and election that they, were, they had liberty and freedom to sin. The more they sin, they said, the more grace abound, abounded. They believed that because they were called, they couldn't do anything to lose their faith. Every time they sinned, it just proved how great God was. Well, Peter, Paul responded to that same false teachings in chapter 6, verse 2. He had a very short, clear statement. He said, absolutely not. That's not the gospel. The gospel work is God changing your heart and making you desire what he desires, making you want what he wants. That is what happens when that seed takes to, soil, to good soil. Paul goes on, Romans 6, verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires and do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead. This is what it looks like when a seed takes root in good soil. Offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you're not under the law, you're under grace. And because of grace, you start to desire the things of the Lord, freely offering yourself to the Lord, pursuing righteousness. All of that comes from the work of the Lord in our hearts. And then Peter returning in verse number 10, he keeps going, the stumbler of all stumblers, Peter. He says, because if you do these things, you'll never stumble. Well, Peter obviously isn't talking here about sinning or making a mistake. He did that repeatedly. His whole life is characterized by a series of stumbles. 
He's saying that our pursuit of godliness, this desire in our hearts to follow Jesus will keep us from stumbling into an eternity separated from our Lord and Savior. He contrasts stumbling with entrance into God's eternal kingdom. In verse number 11, he writes, for in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. That's the main point of our sermon. We confirm God's redemptive work in our lives as we pursue godliness until we enter his eternal kingdom. We confirm God's redemptive work in our lives as we pursue godliness until we enter into his eternal kingdom. Flashback to Peter. He's standing and he's listening to Jesus tell that parable again and and Jesus begins to speak. Jesus says, consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it didn't have much soil. They grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep, but when the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and they choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground, produced fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. Here's a question for all of us today. What does our pursuit of godliness, what does our pursuit of godliness say about the soil of our heart? What does the way that we desire and pursue all of these virtues and characteristics, what does that say about the soil that the seed of salvation has in our hearts? We have to ask the question, has the gospel taken root in good soil or has it fallen on the path? A path where the seed hits the ground and it doesn't enter and it's taken away. Maybe the soil of our hearts like the rocky soil. The seed falls in and we make an emotional decision but there was never any root, there was never any real commitment. And when times of hardship come and when persecution comes and suffering comes, that seed, it dries up. Maybe our hearts, the soil in our hearts is full of thorns. The seed of the gospel comes, but the desires of the world come and they strangle it out so that it can't take root. What's the state of the soil of your heart? Here's good news. I determine the soil of my heart. You determine the state of the soil in your heart. Today, will you choose to accept the good news of the gospel? Will you choose to be in a growing relationship with the Lord where you allow him to change the desires of your heart, where you allow him to make, where you lay down your will and you take up his will? My prayer today is that if you've never allowed the seed of the gospel to take root in your heart, that you would do that today by confessing your sin and committing to follow Jesus. I would love for you to allow one of our pastors or someone that you came with, someone that you know is following Jesus, to pray with you and to help you to walk with you as you make that commitment. Maybe you do that when we come and we sing at the close today. You just grab somebody by the arm and you say, I want to follow Jesus. I want my heart to accept the gospel. For some of us, maybe most of us, we're followers of Jesus. The seed's taken root, but we need to be reminded. Our lack of a desire to to pursue godliness is due to short-sightedness, which has left us blind. We've forgotten that this world's not our own. We've forgotten God's truth. We've forgotten the cleansing work of God for our salvation. If you know the Lord today, if you've committed to follow him, but you realize that you haven't really been pursuing him, remember these things. Remember God's grace. Remember the work that he's done in your life. And then confirm God's redemptive work. Confirm that seed in your heart. Confirm that work by pursuing godliness until you enter into his eternal kingdom. 
My prayer today is that the fruit of our lives, the righteous pursuit of godliness in each of us, every follower of Jesus here at Brainerd, that the root of our lives, our pursuit of godliness would give evidence to a lost world of our Savior and his redemptive work in our lives. How is the soil of your soul today? Has it accepted the gospel? Is it growing? Is it allowing that word, the gospel, to change you? Let's answer that question today before we leave. Let's pray together. God, I love you. I thank you. I praise you. It amazes me, Lord, that you would love us so much, that you would cast seed in places, Lord, where we have hard hearts, or where rocks are in the soil, or where we have thorns in our soil. God, I ask you that our hearts would be Lord, that they would be receptive to your gospel and that you would allow those seeds to take, to take root and God, that they would grow exponentially for your glory. I pray that we would grow in each of these virtues and aspects, that we would culminate our lives being known as those who are godly and who are filled with Christ-like love for others. God, when people see us, I pray, Lord, that the testimony of your work within us would come out, Lord, by the actions that are grounded and rooted in our love for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you join us as we stand and sing?
sanctuary with us today. Church, it's been a great morning of worship and praising our Heavenly Father. Brian and Stephanie, thank you for being with us today. They're going to be with us for a little while. If you'd like to just welcome them and talk with them, uh, I know they would appreciate your prayers. Thanks for being with us, guys. Uh, this afternoon, remember, 530, right here in the sanctuary, we'll have our members meeting. I hope that you'll be a part of that. That's a, a great time of fellowship and for us to know what's going on here at Brainerd Baptist Church and how God is using the ministries and the missions of our church uh, to reach the world around us. Church, we leave you today as we always do with the blessing from Psalm 67. It says, may God be gracious to you and bless you. May he make his face to shine upon you so that his way may be known on the earth and a salvation among all the nations. We love you, church. Go in peace. Have a great week. We'll see you back tonight.